Good morning, my name is Brian, and this morning we're going to be returning to our series in the book of Acts as we look at Acts 21 this morning and consider facing gospel rejection with gospel resolve. And as you find your place in your Bible at Acts 21, I'd encourage you to keep it open this morning. Uh, We'll be going back to it again and again. The outline for the book of Acts is given in Acts 1.8, where Jesus commissions his disciples and tells them, he says this, he says, when my Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so Acts chapters 1 through 7 is about witnesses in Jerusalem, and Acts chapters 8 through 12 is about witnesses in Judea and Samaria, and Acts chapters 13 through 28 are about witnesses to the ends of the earth. We get to Acts 19, and we learn on Paul's third missionary journey that he is resolved to go to Jerusalem and to Rome. And we get to Acts chapter 21 this morning, and we see that as Paul arrives in Rome, the third missionary journey is concluded. But then the book of Acts takes an unexpected turn. You see, instead of glorious conversions and the spread of the gospel, as Paul arrives in Jerusalem, he's met with rejection and he enters Roman captivity. Have you experienced rejection? About 10 years ago, I went through a divorce, and it was the deepest rejection that I've ever experienced. When your spouse calls it quits, the one that you've entered into a covenant with, you've taken vows with, says they no longer want to be a part of your life, there's grief, and heartache, and rejection. Tim Keller says that to be known and loved is one of the deepest desires of our hearts. He says that to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. But he goes on to say, but to be known and not loved is one of the deepest fears of the human heart. Have you experienced Rejection. Now, I, I know my divorce isn't a paradigm for everybody's divorce. I know that all, not all stories are the same. And by the way, if you're walking through a divorce, if you're struggling in your marriage, don't walk that journey alone. Come to the church. We want to walk that with you. Have you experienced rejection? Here's what I'm going to tell you this morning. In the face of gospel rejection, God uses gospel resolve to fulfill his gospel mission. Let me say that again. In the face of gospel rejection, God uses gospel resolve to fulfill his gospel mission. We're going to look at Acts 21 under three headings this morning. First, in verses 1 through 16, we'll consider the resolve on the journey. The resolve on the journey. In verses 17 through 26, we'll consider the response to false accusations, the response to false accusations. And in verses 27 through 36, we'll consider the rejection of the gospel, the rejection of the gospel. So the resolve on the journey, the response to false accusations, and the rejection of the gospel. Because of the length of the passage, I'm going to read it in two different sections this morning, but before we get to our first section, would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we consider this morning the way your gospel gets rejected in Jerusalem, and yet the way you use that to fulfill your glorious mission. I pray that you would convince us of our sin and misery, that you would enlighten our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and that you would renew our wills by the power of your gospel through the work of your Holy Spirit and the mediation of your Son. I ask that you would forgive the one who teaches his sins, for they are many. May we see Jesus in him only. Amen.
So first of all, let's consider together this morning the resolve on the journey in verses 1 through 16. And before I read this, I want you to, to, to look out for three different dimensions of Paul's journey. I want you to look for the distance he's traveling, and then what he's leaving, and then thirdly, where he's going. The distance he's traveling, where, what he's leaving, and where he's going. So focus your attention with me on Acts chapter 21, starting in verse 1. And when we had parted, and we here is Paul and Luke, Luke being the author, and when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in the sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And, and through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed, and we went on our journey, and they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home." When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemus and greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing weeping and breaking my heart for... I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason, of Cyprus, an early disciple, with whom we should lodge. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. So first of all, let's consider the distance Paul's traveling. And if I can get the map here. Uh, so the distance that Paul's traveling. So I'm, I think this magnifies it for you a little bit. Uh, Miletus here is where they are at the end of Acts chapter 20. Um, and from Miletus here to Kos, uh, which is right down there, is about 40 miles. And from Kos to, to over here to Rhodes is about 70 miles. And from Rhodes to Patara is about 60 miles. And then they go on this long sail from Patara they pass Cyprus on the left, all the way down here to, uh, to Tyre. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, to Tyre. And that's about, sorry, and that's about 400 miles. And from Tyre then to Ptolemus, uh, going down next is about 30 miles. And from Ptolemus to Caesarea is about 40 miles. And then they go inland from... Uh, from Caesarea to Jerusalem there in verse 15, and that's about 50 miles. So they travel a total of 690 miles. There are seven stops. It's at least 17 days of travel depending on the wind. So Paul, just in these 16 verses, has this long, grueling trip. Thanks, Andre. Uh, 
And so what, what, is, what is Paul leaving? Well, he's leaving loving community. If you go back to verse 1, it says, and when we had parted from them. Well, who's the them? If you go back and look uh, up in your Bibles to the end of Acts chapter 20, Paul has been staying with the Ephesian elders in Miletus. He had served with the Ephesian elders for two to three years on this third missionary journey, and he longed to see them again. These are old and dear friends, co-laborers in the gospel, ministry partners. And if you look at the end of verse 20, they're kneeling down and praying and weeping and embracing and kissing, and they're sorrowful. Why? Because there's grief in leaving a loving community. In verse 4, Paul arrives at Tyre, and he seeks out disciples in the city, and apparently these are new friends, and he stays with them for seven days. But when they're leaving, in verse 7, the new community accompanies them until they're outside the city. The wives and the kids go with them down to the beach, and they kneel down, and they pray, and they say, farewell. And there's grief in leaving a loving community. And you get to verse 8, and they arrive in Caesarea, and Paul stays with Philip the evangelist. And Philip the evangelist is one of the original deacons in Acts chapter 6. And Philip had preached the gospel in Samaria to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. And the last time we saw Philip, he was staying in Caesarea which is where we find him now. And in verses 12 and 13, when Paul is ready to depart, they urge him not to go, and there's weeping and heartbreak. And this is the third time in 16 verses that there's grief in leaving a loving community. Now, there's a curious detail in verse 9. Look at verse 9 in your text here. Philip had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Why does Luke include this detail? It doesn't move the plot forward. The four unmarried daughters aren't mentioned again. This is just speculation. I didn't see this in any of the commentaries, so it's my personal take. Perhaps uh, to make fathers, you know, who have lots of daughters, Philip had four, I have six, uh, to make them feel okay here, you know, because when a man lives in his own sorority, sometimes he needs to know he's not alone, right? J just speculation uh, here. Why, why does Luke include this detail? Well, one commentator says that this reminds us of the promise of Joel fulfilled at Pentecost that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And that's true, that's true, but I think there's more. I think that Luke includes verse 9 to honor women. You see, prophecy was a key gift in the church. Sometimes it was connected with authority. It was a gift of honor. But in New Testament times, women had no honor. Women had no status. Women had no standing. They were outsiders. But Jesus' kingdom values women. Another commentator says, the breaking of human barriers in Christ is one of the main sub-themes in Acts. You see, Luke honors women again and again. Women are with the disciples during the prayer meetings before Pentecost. It's because the Greek widows were neglected that the office of deacon was created in Acts chapter 6. Dorcas and Lydia and Priscilla all have key roles in Acts. And did you notice did you notice Philip's daughters are unmarried? It's single women that Luke is honoring. You see, outsiders in society are insiders in God's kingdom. So single women, married women, you have a place of honor in the life of the church. You're valued, you belong, you're a vital part of gospel ministry. Paul travels 690 miles. He leaves three loving communities, and where is he going? While Paul is staying with Philip in Caesarea, in verse 10, a prophet 
Agabus comes from Judea, specifically from Jerusalem. And look at verse 11. And coming to us, Agabus took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and his hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So in the mode of Old Testament prophets, Agabus is acting out what's going to happen to Paul. As Paul goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be rejected. He's going to be bound, and he's going to be, en- he's going to be delivered to the Gentiles. You see, Paul is encountering obstacle after obstacle. He travels 690 miles. He leaves three loving communities, and he's facing rejection and bondage. But notice Paul's resolve. It's there in verse 13. He says, For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Where does Paul get that kind of resolve? Paul's willing to go to prison. He's willing to die for Jesus. Where does that kind of resolve come from? In 2006, NBC released a TV series that was called Friday Night Lights. And Friday Night Lights was about a high school football team in a fictional town of Dillon, Texas. And in Dillon, Texas, there wasn't anything other than high school football. The whole town hinged on what happened with this football team. And Friday Night Lights was shot Uh, with a a documentary kind of style, and so there was a sense of authenticity about it. And at the heart of the show was the rallying cry that was said before each game. And that rallying cry was, clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. And that rallying cry was about football, but it was about much more than football. It became an approach to life, an approach to life that was full of optimism and hope, right? And you see, this enabled the show to engage with obstacles in life, like alcoholism, or racism, or life-altering injury, or unwanted pregnancy. The show was ultimately about obstacles, and the idea was you can overcome all of these obstacles, if you have clear eyes, that is, eyes that are open, eyes that are unobstructed, eyes that can see what's important, what really matters, and if you have a full heart, a heart that's full of joy and hope and love. But you see, the reason that Friday Night Lights won so many viewers and won awards, gathered this huge following, was because that rallying cry, clear eyes, full heart, can't lose, connected deeply to a gospel truth that's etched on all of our hearts. You see, Paul can see clearly. He has clear eyes, and he can see that in Jesus, in Christ alone, he is fully loved and fully known. And so his heart is full. It's full of hope and joy because he knows that he is loved by a Savior who will not let him go. And so Keller says that being fully known and fully loved is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense. It humbles us out of our self-righteousness and fortifies us for any difficulty that life can throw at us. Clear eyes, full heart, can't lose. And Paul understands that he's fully known and fully loved, and so he writes in Philippians 3.8, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Clear eyes, full heart. He says in Philippians 1.21, For me to live is Christ 
is, and to die is gain. And later in verse 23, he says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. That's Paul's resolve on the journey. And that's why he's willing to be imprisoned. He's willing even to die for the name of Jesus. Now, sometimes I'm a little disappointed <clears throat> that I lack Paul's resolve. You, you ever feel this way? Why am I not ready to be imprisoned? Why am I not ready to die for the name of Jesus? But you see, when we think about the future, those circumstances out there, we often do it in a vacuum. We picture the circumstances, but we picture those circumstances apart from God's grace, apart from God's future grace. You see, if you're a believer, when the obstacles come, God's grace to persevere meets you in that moment. And you could never anticipate the fullness of that grace before that moment arrives. And this changes the way we see obstacles, doesn't it? You see, we want God to remove our obstacles. We want God to change our circumstances, but God sees the bigger picture. He wants to use those obstacles to shape your heart, to shape your life, to shape your soul. You see, these obstacles, they're fleeting. They'll be gone soon, but your soul, your soul is eternal. One of my favorite parenting articles is entitled, Prepare Your Child for the Road, Not the Road for Your Child. And don't you see? That's exactly what God is doing in your life. God is preparing His child for the road, not the road for his child. What if God wants to use your obstacles in your life to shape your soul? Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. That's the resolve for the journey. But then second and thirdly, I want to consider the response to false accusations and the rejection of the gospel. So let's look at the second half of the passage here, Acts chapter 21, starting at verse 17. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry, and when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law, and they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus, all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then, Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought, brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place." 
For they had previously seen Trophus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took, took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another, and as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. God, so far, God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word, may he write its eternal truth upon all of our hearts. So secondly then, this morning, let's consider in verses 17 through 26, the response to false accusations. The response to false accusations. In verse 17, Paul arrives in Jerusalem, and all of a sudden, the narrative slows down. You see, for the last three chapters, Luke has been relating to you Paul's third missionary journey, starting back at Acts 18, verse 23, until the end, until the middle here of Acts 21. And this third missionary journey covers four to five years, three chapters, four to five years. For the next two and a half chapters, Luke is relating to you what's happening in just two weeks. And so Luke is slowing you down. He's focusing your attention. In verses 18 and 19, Paul reports to James and the elders about what God has done among the Gentiles. And did you notice the way he phrases it? Look there in verse 19. After greeting them, he related one by one what? The things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. You see, Luke always talks about ministry through the lens of God's sovereignty. This is God's work. It's God's work to spread the gospel. He's saying God is in charge of the advance of His kingdom. And then in verses 20 to 25, there's the elders' report of the Jewish accusation and they give a proposed response. And and here's the heart of the accusation. It's this, that Paul is teaching Jews to forsake Moses and circumcision and Jewish customs. Look, Look at verse 21. And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. But is that what Paul's teaching? That's not what Paul's teaching. The accusation here takes us back to Acts 15 and the Jerusalem Council, which was the last time Paul and the elders dealt with a controversy around Moses and circumcision. And do you remember the question in Acts 15? It was, do Gentiles need to be circumcised in order to be saved? Do Gentiles need to be circumcised in order to be saved? And the answer came back, no, right? Circumcision is not salvific. It never was. It was just a sign of the covenant. You see, what Paul is teaching is that Jesus came to fulfill the law, to fulfill the law of Moses, to fulfill the Torah, to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. And so under the new covenant, circumcision, Jewish customs are what's called adiaphora. That is, they're things indifferent. They're not required. They're not forbidden, right? Paul's not teaching Jewish believers to forsake circumcision. He's teaching freedom around circumcision. It's okay to be circumcised. It's okay not to be circumcised. In Galatians 6, 15, 
Paul writes, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. There's freedom around Jewish customs. And how does Paul use that freedom? He uses that freedom to build Christ's church, to build God's kingdom. In 1 Corinthians 9.20, he says, to the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law that I might win those under the law. Jewish customs are now free things. You can engage in them. You cannot engage in them. So, when it comes to Timothy's ministry to a Jewish community, Paul has Timothy circumcised. And when it comes to Titus's ministry to a Gentile community, Titus is not circumcised. You see, Paul is firm on doctrine that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. And he's firm on ethics. Christians are obliged to obey the moral law. But Paul is flexible on culture and tradition and ceremony. So, the elders come up with a plan. They come up with a response to these false accusations. In order to show Jerusalem that you are not teaching Jews to forsake Moses and circumcision and Jewish customs, hey, why don't you undergo a Jewish custom? We've got these four men. They're under a vow. Take these men, purify yourself with them so that you can be presented with them at the temple. One commentator says that coming from abroad, Paul would have had to regain ceremonial purity by a seven-day ritual of purification before he could enter the temple. Paul, undergo a Jewish custom. And what will be the result? Look at verse 24. The elders say, thus all will know there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. And so, in verse 26, Paul does it. He undergoes the Jewish custom of purification to enter the temple. And so, he's using his gospel freedom to give a gospel response to the false accusations. He's becoming a Jew to the Jews in order to win Jews. And of course, as he's doing that, He's just imitating Jesus. This story is told of a farmer uh, who on Christmas Eve is contemplating the mystery of the incarnation. And he looks out uh, in, into his yard and he sees a flock of birds near his barn and he sees a blizzard coming. And he knows that the flock of birds is not going to survive the blizzard unless they're in the barn. And so, he bundles up and he goes outside, and the first thing that he does is he turns the light on in the barn. But the birds don't come, and the storm's getting closer. Then he decides, I'm going to scare them into the barn, and so he waves his arms and yells, and the birds don't come and the storm's getting closer. And then he decides, I'm going to lure them with feed into the barn. And so he lays out the bird seed, but the birds don't come, and the storm is getting closer. And finally, exhausted out of using all of his different ideas, he crumples up in a heap, and he thinks, if only I could enter their world. If only I could become a bird, I could explain to them that the only way for them to be safe is to hide in the barn. And that moment, he realizes that that's what Jesus did. That's a part of the incarnation. And so you see Paul becoming a Jew to the Jews in order to win Jews is just imitating Jesus who became a human to win Jews humans. That's a part of the response to these false accusations. Paul uses these Jewish customs to enter into their world. 
But then, in verses 27 to 36, we have the rejection of the gospel. In verse 27, the Jews see Paul in the temple and they're angry. Why? Because in verse 29, they had seen him with a Gentile, Trophimus the Ephesian, and they had supposed that Paul had brought this Gentile into the temple. And according to verse 28, we see that bringing a Gentile into the temple would have defiled the temple. And the Jews take this very seriously. So seriously, one commentator points out that they had convinced the Roman authorities to authorize the death sentence for the trespass of a Gentile in the temple, even when the offenders were Roman citizens. It was a death sentence for a Gentile to go into the temple. And the Jews supposed that Paul brought a Gentile into the temple. Now, now don't don't miss the irony here, right? Because Paul takes seven days and shells out big bucks in order to enter the temple according to Jewish custom in a state of legal purity. And now he's accused of profaning the temple. And in verse 30, the Jewish mob seizes Paul and they're beating him, trying to kill him. And then the Roman tribute gets word And the Roman tribune comes down with at least 200 soldiers, and the beating stops. And in verse 33, the tribune arrests Paul. And by the way, that word for arrest in 33 is the same word that's used in verse 30, where it says the mob seized Paul. And by using the same word in these two different places, Luke is contrasting the Jewish hostility with the Roman protection. The crowd seized Paul to beat him, but the tribune seized Paul to take him into protective custody. And then in verses 34 and 35, because of the confusion and the violence of the crowd, Paul is taken into the Roman barracks. And then look at verse 36. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him, away with him. Now, verse 36 there is styled very much after the trial of Jesus. Do you remember there was another Jewish mob, and do you remember what they cried out? Away with him, give us Barabbas, Luke 23, 18. So, Jerusalem is rejecting Paul, They're rejecting Paul's message. They're rejecting Paul's gospel, and it's a violent rejection. You see, away with him isn't just, you know, kind of get him out of here, take him away. It's do away with him. They're seeking his demise. They're seeking to end his life. This is the rejection of the gospel. One commentator says, the bulk of Jerusalem has now rejected Jesus, they've rejected Peter, they've rejected John, they've rejected Stephen, and now they're rejecting Paul. And for Acts, this is the final key rejection of the gospel. In the book of Acts, Jerusalem is now left behind and Paul will never return. And this rejection of the gospel is just the beginning of Paul's journey of suffering and injustice. You see, from here to the end of the book of Acts, Paul, a Roman citizen, an innocent man, is condemned for his commitment to the gospel. Remember in verse 13, he said he was ready to be imprisoned and even die for Jesus. And here, his imprisonment begins. And this may look disappointing. It may seem a little bit like a failure. Instead of glorious conversions and the spread of the gospel, now there's rejection and captivity. But do you see it? Paul's suffering and his rejection, Paul's imprisonment and the injustice is precisely how the gospel will get to Rome. Rome. 
And do you know what Rome is? Rome is the ends of the earth. It's the center of the civilized world. You see, Paul's suffering and rejection is how God is going to fulfill the mission of Acts 1.8. It's how the gospel is going to get to the ends of the earth. And did you expect it any other way? That the Christian life is cross-shaped. Of course, we're going to follow in the way of our Savior. Paul writes in Philippians 3, verse 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, and what? And share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. You see, the Christian life is a paradox. The Valley of Vision, that old Puritan prayer book, puts it this way. It prays, let me learn by paradox that the way down is the way up, that to be low is to be high, that the broken heart is the healed heart, that the contrite spirit is the rejoicing spirit, that the repenting soul is the victorious soul, that to have nothing is to possess all, that to bear the cross is to wear the crown, that to give is to receive, that the valley is the place of vision. Of course, God is going to use suffering and rejection to fulfill His mission. The prayer concludes, Lord, in the daytime, stars can be seen from deepest wells, and the deeper the wells, the brighter your stars shine. Let me find your light in my darkness, your life in my death, your joy in my sorrow, your grace in my sin, your riches in my poverty, your glory in my valley. You see, in the face of gospel rejection, God uses gospel resolve to fulfill His gospel mission. May it be so in our lives. Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. You think about that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, so often as we see obstacles and suffering that lays ahead of us, our hearts want to run and hide, but would you give us the gospel resolve that comes from hiding our hearts in Christ alone, to know that we are fully loved and fully known. Would that become real in our lives right now? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.